You're listening to the Woman of Value podcast. You are about to hear the story of a woman who is following her dreams and passions and creating positive change in the world. It's about emotional regulation and and move stepping into a power struggle that takes over your own well-being. And then it's like losing consciousness in a way. It is losing consciousness. Yeah. So that's what, so for me, that's been my journey. And that's really what Love Skills is about. It's all about mindfulness and how we can step back and take a pause in everything. And unhooking the loop, which is sort of my big thing, has to come from stepping back, not forward. Welcome back to the Women of Value podcast. I am so excited to introduce you to my guest today. I first met Linda Carroll on the Huffington Post live segment where she was talking about her first book, Love Cycles. I had submitted a question, she answered it, and I thought she was amazing. And I immediately connected with her and said, come to my radio show, Last First Date Radio. Well, she just came out with another book, and I'm excited to have her back today to talk about her new book, Love Skills. This is the companion workbook to Love Cycles. She has worked as a therapist and a couples coach for over three decades, and she has acquired many certificates and degrees along the way, but she says that her own 35-year marriage is the primary source of her knowledge when it comes to the cycles of love. Welcome to, back to the show, Linda. What was the question that I answered that you liked so much? Do you remember? I'm trying to remember. It had something to do with um, people in crisis, I think, yeah, but I have no idea what I asked you, but you answered it well. So let's start with what I always ask every guest, which is what does woman of value mean to you? I thought about this and I had all kinds of answers come into my head that were kind of cliches, but I, the real answer for me is a woman of value means that I understand my imperfections, my vulnerabilities, and I have worth because of them, because I keep going, because I keep working with them. And so a woman of value is not, it's about being an imperfect human and I, rather than getting somewhere. I love that. Yeah. So wise and so but, true. But so hard to get to in our culture where my value is, is, it includes my vulnerabilities and my, in, and my imperfections rather than something I need to achieve. Yeah. And we're so focused most of our life on our value being tied into our achievements and to being perfect and we have to look a certain way and act a certain way. And in fact, tonight I'm giving a lecture on anxiety in dating and relationships. And when I threw this question out to my people about what makes them anxious when they're on dates or in relationships, it was all about this imperfection piece. You know, I'm not, I'm going to be judged because I'm, my body isn't perfect. I am, I'm not going to be liked um, because I'm not interesting enough. And it's like, you know, it's, we have to embrace the fact that we are all different and it's a beautiful thing that we have qualities that make us not exactly clones of each other. And, you but, know. and I think also that, that, that the biggest piece for me is even though I'm in a long-term marriage is being self-partnered and that self that I'm partnered with in me is accepting of myself. So my measurement stick is no longer other people. Mm. I just had lunch with a girlfriend. I haven't seen her since I was 16 mm. and from high school. We talked about this, the torture of that age of all the comparisons and, and getting to the place where I don't have to compare myself. I just am me. But I'll tell you what, I'm really lucky because I never thought I was perfect. I, I, I did not come from perfect to accepting imperfection. I came from feeling like a mess a whole lot of my life to accepting that mess as a part of, of what I got to be where my wisdom and my compassion came from. So mm. I didn't start out with that fall. For me, it was going up, not down. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, I think most of us don't think we're perfect. I think that it's that we have this bar that we set that's not realistic. And that 16 year old self, oh my God. Oh my God. I, I look at my children and now they're 25 and up, but 
the obsession over my son starting to lose his hair a little bit and it was just like oh my god my hair i'm like you have hair you have other hair it's really okay <laughs> but i get it i get it he's got to get he it's not going to it's not going to make him better he's just got to come to that point which is this it's sort of that that cliche about when you lose something or when when what is it my house burned down i could see the moon yeah. when you lose your hair you start to value the other parts of who you are or you don't you stay in agony a long time yeah which is also a choice yeah yeah now he he has embraced his entire head and the rest of him too but it took a while it, when he went through all of the the research and and the brushing of the head and maybe that will make it grow back and the rogaine he never went that route but but it, isn't it true that as we lose parts of ourself that we either regrow another part of ourself that is more potent or we just stay in that loss forever i love that and and I'm in I'm in a stage right now where I'm regrouping, and I find that as an entrepreneur, as a solo business owner, we have to really take steps back when something gets lost, something doesn't work, and we can easily go to that place of there must be something wrong with me, and what's wrong with me, and then I should quit and go work at Starbucks because they have medical benefits, <laughs> you know, it's like. <laughs> And then, you know, you take that step back and you regroup and you can mourn the loss of what was, but see it as an opportunity to grow something new or regroup into something that will be better for your audience. And so that's, I'm in that stage right now. Yeah. 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 And, and I go there pretty often, you know, really important to take steps back and see where am I using my time, my energy my gifts and is this draining the life out of me <laughs> is this worth it you know and if it's not then then we have to really take that leap into something new that's right yeah yeah loss is it's an important part of life cycle <laughs> so is i think so is taking the time to grieve the loss yeah. and not moving too fast to trying to make it something new but to really look at what was that for me and to say goodbye to it. Yeah, yeah, totally. And I'm, I'm the, uh, let's go really fast past the loss. I, am, I, don't like, I don't like the pain. I just want to keep moving, but I've learned, <laughs> I've got to be able to pause and to go into it just to be able to really release it. Otherwise yeah. it just gets stuck somewhere and it comes up in different forms over and over. Yeah, and mine came up last night when I couldn't fall asleep. And I was like, wait a minute, I thought I was done with that thing. And, and it was a whole bunch of things together. And it was like, wait a minute, let's piece this apart. Something's happening that's keeping me awake. And I've got to really work through this. And I meditated and did a bunch of things to help me work through it. But it's like, you can't, you can't bypass it. You know, and your body also really doesn't lie. You know, it's like your body's going to, wake up <laughs> here i am <laughs> that's right attention yeah yeah it's the the wisdom of of aging is that we do get to hopefully work through some of these things not all of us but hopefully yes. um so take us through that aha moment that you had when you realized that you needed to make a change and step into your value Okay, there's so many of them, but I thought about there's one this love skills. And by the way, it started as a workbook. It's its own entity. Yeah. It's it, it is it has it has exercises, but it's so it's got so much more, including a, my husband said you are you have come unplugged because I tell so much about myself and our relationship. I and instead that. of using examples, I really talk about what happened in my own marriage. Um the the uh, one of the many aha moments was I was Tim and I were teaching classes. We were teaching the first vari first variation of love skills. I was a therapist, M, a therapist in this town. We had people to dinner. We were in this power struggle that w has gone on for the since we met each other forty five years ago. We've had the same issue around doing the dishes, and it sounds corny, but it, it wasn't. And as I, I go through it, I describe the cycles and I describe that, that power struggle in each of the cycles because it was cute at first, our differences. But this is when we were in what I call the loop. And it was really hardcore. Okay, 
Before I say that, I'm going to do a sidebar. The issue is so seldom what the issue is really about. You know, it's not about the spinach or the dishes or the dog. It's really about you don't listen to me. You don't respect me. You've disappeared. We're talking and now you've cut me off. So it's about so many other things. But we thought it was about the dishes. We had this couple to dinner. And here we are, this sort of cool couple that teaches relationship skills. And we got into a fight. We were time to clear the table. And we got into it. And it was really bad. It was so bad, Sandy. We, in, we, involved, we brought the dishes with our point of view to the people that, at the table. <laughs> they looked stricken. We started to, it was like we were in court. And I put out my point of view. And he said, well, no, don't you, what do you think? Don't you think blah, blah. I won't get into the issue because I still think I'm right. So I could <laughs> explore it in the, but, but they were stricken. And suddenly I saw we were so in this loop and power struggle that we had lost, totally lost our ability to manage ourselves. And it was, I was beside, I was mortified, but more than that, I mean, the, you know, the thoughts came, I'm a therapist, I'm teaching classes, my career is over, they've seen the truth, because we were in that terrible power struggle moment where your ability to pause has disappeared. And so later I tried to talk with my husband about what had happened, and he started talking about how he was right. And for me, it was like this clarity of moment, I thought, I can't, I'm not going to change him. I'm not leaving. I've got to, I can't do this anymore. I have to do something different. This has gotten really serious. It's no longer about the dishes. It's about everything. And, and I, I began to, to really try to understand what happened to me that I so lost my, my bearings, my capacity to, um, I I see what's the word I'm trying to use you know, not, I don't even want to say rational, but my capacity to be aware of the people around me, that I, that I had gotten so angry at him that I was really scared. Like, how could I do this? And so I started on my own exploration. What was happening? What got triggered in me? And I actually started to change it. And as I, as I say in the book, I go through this journey. We don't agree. We still don't agree, but we laugh about it now because he got into the, he also joined me and eventually and said we can't do this and so we changed our reaction not our belief but our reaction and and so but that moment i think it had sort of professional embarrassment in it and also this i was shocked at my own behavior with myself as well as with other people that was one of many moments but mm. that was for some reason that was a big big one yeah i read that in the book and it was it was so profound to me as well because we get we can get so caught up in these ways of believing in something and it's it's right and you're wrong and and even to bring it out in public and i've been there i i i remember with parenting and my parenting differences and i was so angry at my daughter once when she was very young and we had company over and it, and i was like and you do and i was like screaming at my kid and that stays with me today because my parenting shifted a lot after that moment. But I remember that public humiliation of I was trying to show my friends that my daughter wasn't going to power over me. And so I was going to let her know who's boss. And the moment that I gave up that need to power over my children and to really tune in to my children and have compassion and take that pause everything changed. Yes, that's right. It's, it, it's about, I mean, really, it's about emotional regulation and, and move, stepping into a power struggle that takes over your own well-being. And yeah. then it's like losing consciousness in a way. It is losing consciousness. Yeah. So that's what, so for me, that's been my journey. And that's really what Love Skills is about. It's all about mindfulness and how we can step back and take a pause in everything and un unhooking the loop, which is sort of my big thing, has to come from stepping back, not forward. Yeah, that. And that of course, pause. I still do it, but I don't do it as much, <laughs> and I catch myself, and I and I move back more quickly. And I'm glad you said that because it's it's the speed with which we recover 
that changes. It's not, I'm going to eradicate this behavior forever. I've done the work. I am perfect now. <laughs> this is part we back to the good. vulnerability, right? Yeah. We make mistakes. It doesn't matter if we're a public figure, if people look to you and say, well, you wrote the book on love skills. Like, come right. on. <laughs> That's right. That's right. What is up with that? But I think being able to not only make the mistakes, but even if you made it in public today, you'd be able to repair it probably in public as well. Yeah. And one of those ways of repairing it is saying, I just blew it. Yeah. I do it too. You know, it's part, it's, it's a normal, I think one of the things my clients, one of the things my clients tell me they really love about what I do with them is they say, you help normalize what we thought was a sign something was wrong. And you help us see that it's just part of normal life and normal relationships. Mm. That's beautiful. And I wish, you know, as I was reading the book, I, I was thinking about my own marriage and how many issues we had and the therapists who were so ineffective in helping us. Nobody gave us skills. They would tell us, go home and work on that and try this. And one, one therapist went so far as to say, well, my marriage is great. And I'm like, well, you are not me. And what does that have to do with me? Yeah, it was awful. It was awful. He was like, and I love my wife so much that it's like reading a book and I can't wait to turn the pages. And I'm like, you're not hearing a word. That's not I'm therapy. Saying, that is not therapy. No, not therapy. That's and some he was, sort of... Oh. We had one who fell asleep while we were in therapy. <laughs> I just that a long time ago. Uh, yeah, because my marriage is over twelve years, and we were married twenty three years. So it happened. You know, we were on and off, but not that long ago. <laughs> it isn't so long ago. It is hard to find the right person, though. Yeah, it is. You know? It is. I mean, I I click with some clients wonderfully, and I know how to step into the ring with them and and be there as a part of it. Other times I don't. It doesn't work. Yeah. I think you have to be willing to, to really, if, what, who works for one person may not work for another person. Yes. So yeah. I'm, I trust that more and more. So it's not somebody as good. It's not one size fits all. But no. falling asleep or talking <laughs> or telling you what to do with your marriage or telling you about their great marriage, is, that's, no. that's not about a good fit. That's something else. No, and I left both of those therapists. But it was, it was hard to find somebody who would actually give me work. And I, I kept begging, give me something to do when I leave this office because coming here for 45 minutes is not enough. We need skills. And they'd be like, huh, homework, what? Because actually therapy, just the word therapy for marriage therapy in, in so, so many cases, isn't really the right word. I mean, we use it, but it's not that you need therapy. It's that you need the skills. We never learn those skills. Yeah. And we never learn. And a lot of them are, begin with oneself. Yes. And, and how to manage ourselves. Yeah. And I love, I love where you go in the book. So I wanted to talk about that because, you know, we, we talk about the, the downloaded blueprint that we get from our families, but you really go into detail about not just the families that we came from, but I love the whole part where you actually go through the generations and then the details about each person and the patterns that we begin to see and the, the compassion that you can feel once you understand where somebody came from. So can you tell us a little bit about the example you give in the book of the man with the, whose father was very cold to him and he didn't uh -huh. really understand him? Well, he was not, he wasn't, he, he wasn't cold and he wasn't warm. He was sort of not there. Right. And he, he showed up for things, soccer practice, scouts. He was a good, he was a good father. And he, and, and the client always felt like he had a sense his father loved him, but he also didn't know who his father was. And when we did the geneogram, we went back and he, there were three missing years, I think. And he said, I don't know what, what I don't know. He was in the war. I said, well, where was he? And he didn't know. And he, and he went and asked his uncle, his father had died. And his uncle said he was in a POW camp for three years in the Vietnam War. And my client was just blown away. 
And then he talked to his mother. They had never talked about it. And, and what he understood then was that his father had PTSD, which wasn't talked about. He was depressed his whole life and he was disassociated. He was so traumatized in that experience as a young boy that he came back, but he didn't come back. And so he showed up, he was almost robotic. And it wasn't that he didn't care about his kids, but he, you can only care as much as you're alive inside. And when he understood that, everything changed in him. He felt such compassion for not only his dad, but his parents' marriage that he had judged as being so dead. You know, it, he, he understood it. And I think it, it connected him to his father as a young man. I remember him saying, he was younger than I am when all that happened. Who was that boy? And I just, he just melted into this person. His heart just expanded mm. and it didn't go away. Wow. And he was a minister mm. and it really affected how he worked with people after that too. So mm. that was a long time ago, but that was when I realized the power of understanding our parents' story. Yeah. Not just how it affected us, but also in helping us understand that some of where they didn't know what to do came from their own eight-year-old or three-year-old or traumatic start. Yeah, yeah. It's such an important piece. And it made me start to think about my own family in a much more compassionate way. I just did a workshop with a friend called Our Mother's Daughters. And this is like the 10th time we've done this particular one. And the pro and in that it's five days. And so one of the pieces is to tell the story as a child about your mother. And then the, uh, the, the other thing that we do a few days later is we have them tell the story of their life as though they're their mother, beginning from the very beginning and stopping when they, the speaker, were born. So they talk about their mother as though it's them. And when you hear these stories of these young women who had so much fewer options than we do, who lived in such different times, it was just the room was filled with compassion. You know, it doesn't take away from what didn't happen or did that wasn't good, but to be able to have empathy shifts so much inside of yourself and creates empathy for yourself. Yeah, that's so also because you know, I'm old enough now that I look back on myself and my kids are not are very quick to point out where it was that I wasn't there for them and I wish I had been. But I and I can I can accept that because I have empathy, and I can say I'm sorry because I have empathy for the woman I the young woman I was. Hmm. That's yeah. been a journey. Yeah, such a journey, and I love mother daughter workshop. That's such a great idea. And it reminds me of the part in the book where you talk about pillow talk and having people take the side of the other person that they're in a couple with. So yeah, can you talk a little more about that? Well, I think that the black belt of relationship, the skill that, that is the, the most important skill in communication is when you can talk about an issue where your partner's views are threatening to you, really threatening. And yours are threatening to your partner and yet you can stay connected and in a bigger view isn't that what's going on in our country people are cutting each other off because they have different political points of view in in our couple dynamic you know there's there are some thorny issues we get into and much more thorny than the dishes <laughs> having a kid not having a kid moving where we live someone's had an affair someone's someone has an addiction and being able to talk about the issue and know that with all of your heart and head, you disagree with what your partner is saying, but not lose connection, to still be able to feel respectful and respected, to leave the conversation, not changed necessarily, but to stay, to stay in, the, in, the, in the friendship, in the love, to know you still have your friend, that's big power. And that is pra lots of practice. Yeah. Smaller issues to do it. And pillow talk is part of that when I really can hear your point of view and not only hear it, but imagine if I were you, how it would make sense to me to feel that way. And uh, I, had a, I had a couple once who, di who di they had gotten together with an agreement they would never have children. 
And the woman and they was 39, I think, 39 or 40, and suddenly changed. And they had a great marriage, a great lifestyle. And she said, I want a child, and there's no negotiating. So they came to see me, and it was really heavy and hard. And I said, will you take six months, and will you each be willing to explore why you feel as strongly as you do? And I brought in the pillow talk. And here's what happened. After six months, and they were great, and they did it. After six months, where they, the guy realized in exploring his point of view that he had a family that had never appreciated having kids. They were dutiful, but there was no joy in it. And he didn't want to pass that on. The woman realized that she had always wanted to be an artist and she wasn't making it. And as she entered this age, she thought, I have to have something. And then she thought, I can have a baby. And what happened is they did the pillow talk experiment after doing their own self work and he changed his mind. And he said, I want a child. Guess what happened to her? She changed her mind. She said, I don't, I want to be an artist. <laughs> so then we had a whole new thing to deal with, which we did and they did a wonderful thing and they made an agreement. One child, he hated his job. He would stay home and he would work from home and he would take care of the child and she'd go off to art school and do what she always wanted. And they did. Wow. Isn't that great? <laughs> That's a great but story. They had to be willing to hold, they had to be willing to enter into that letting go of being right and understanding the other person's perspective. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, that's a wonderful story. And the pillow talk, um, just to, I don't know if we explain, like somebody sits on the pillow and basically is like the other person takes the other person's point of view. This is why I don't want a child. And then you switch. Yeah. And I become my partner and say, this is why I don't want a child and really try to put myself into their perspective, their point of view, their feelings. And it's very potent if yeah. you really do it with heart and, and intention. Totally. Yeah. Totally. I, I, I did this work um, a little differently when my now 25 year old was a teenager and we had just gotten divorced and she was so angry at me and every day was a challenge. And the easiest thing would have been to say, go live with your father. You're being so mean to me. He lives a mile away. Goodbye. <laughs> Right. But that's abandonment, and I didn't want to do that. So I said, okay, I need support. So I hired a coach who was a relationship coach who had been through relationship training. And she had me draw a triangle on the ground. And one point of the triangle was me, one was her, and one was our relationship. And she had me stand on each point and look at the issue yeah. from the perspective of yes. each point. Yeah. Yeah, that was so profound for me. It was really life-changing because she sees the world very differently from me and I wanted her to see it my way. And I judged her based on some action she was taking, like leaving the door wide open when it was cold outside because she has ADD and she would forget that the door was open or forget that she left the light on or her backpack in the room. And so there were a lot of things that felt like she was doing them to me and she wasn't. You know, and so to let go of that judgment of, well, she's, you know, if she loved me, <laughs> she wouldn't do those things. And I think we often do that in all our relationships, you know, and I, I grew up with that model. You know, if they love me, they would read my mind. If they love me, they would just know. But Sandy, you're talking about something else here besides that that's so important in my book. And I spend some time talking about it. And I actually am creating an online course right now. And that's what I'm, I'm talking about, this very thing in the, in the video, which is you have to be willing to do it and to let go of being right. We can have all of the exercises in the world, all of the, the suggestions for things like that to do. But if you go into that exercise without really being able to risk seeing something new, that's the word risk, then it's not going to work. You can, yeah. you know, people can do this like robots and they can do pillow talk and all the other things that you know how to teach people. I know how to teach people. So the first thing is willingness. And the second thing that I, that I'm talking about in this book is that, you, and this is um, maybe different than that many of the books out there that have exercises. You don't have to have a willing partner. In fact, every workbook could be 
another reason to get into a therapist's office because it could be another power struggle. And usually it's women that buy them. They bring them home to their partners and say, if they're with a man, they say, well, um, uh, this is great. Let's do it. And he says, are you kidding? I don't want to do this. And then it becomes a fight. And now they have another trouble. So we can work on ourselves with all of these skills. And if the other person, our daughter, our partner, doesn't want to do it, it still can help us create more space to understand more, to make, to make more clear choices about what we do in that relationship. Yeah, absolutely. I, my, none of my kids ever wanted to go into therapy with me. And my husband was reluctantly going to therapy with me. So it was always what I chose to take upon myself and the interchanges that I went through. And people would either respond to the change because you're changing the dance, whether you, you know, it's, it's, you're, you're, the script changes. You're not the same. You're not going to react the way you did in the past. And I remember that pivotal moment with my daughter where she told me I ruined her life and she was going back and forth to the, to my ex's house and she had all her clothes in her hands because she never packed a suitcase that was part of the ADD and you ruined my life. And so I just said to her, I never did this to ruin your life. I apologize that it's been so hard for you. And um, there are some skills you can learn around you know, having an easier time with this. And when you're ready, I'm here to help you. Mm. And that was it. Done mm. with the conversation. I didn't react. I didn't raise my voice. And it threw her. She was like, oh. You know, and, and I saw the, the calm that went over her because I changed yes. how I responded. That's right. That's right. So understanding your own boundaries and realizing this is the biggest thing I know. I can't change anybody else. Yeah. I can only change myself. And that means usually stepping back and taking a pause and thinking, okay, what do I need to do for me now? You're going to do what you do. Yeah. And that's really painful because sometimes, you know, I want to change my partner, for example, if we're since we're talking about relationships, because if he did things differently, then it would be easier for me. And if what he's, if what he's doing is really not acceptable, then it may mean I have to leave and I don't want to do that. So please change. <laughs> and it's not going to work. I have to get, I have to, and what you're describing is exactly my truth too, which is for all my relationships, here's where I can be with you and here's where I can't. And you, your part's your part. Yeah. But that came after trying to change people, many of them for most of my life. So that's a lot, that's a hard fought wisdom. It didn't just come because I read a book. Oh yeah. <laughs> who are listening to this they're 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 going to say yes but i mean for years we'd go to workshops and i and this would be something that i'd know we go as clients but i would secretly think maybe he's going to hear a message maybe he's going to get it <laughs> but I, I don't do that anymore that's not my business yeah you know? it's, so I really... it's not easy it's not easy but it takes practice and it takes a lot of humility and a lot of self-compassion to get yeah. there too yeah. 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 I mean, I, I had another opportunity to enforce this with my daughter just the other day. She kept telling me she's going to come for dinner. And then she wanted to come when she wanted to come. So she goes, I'll come at seven. I said, well, we're eating at six. So she goes, well, I'm really tired. I said, well, we're eating at six. If you would like to join us, I'd love to see you. And if you come later, that's fine too. I'd love to see you then too, <laughs> but we're going to eat at six. You know, it's like <laughs> got that one down. That's it. That's it. Right, and I and that took many years because we had many family members who would show up late, and we'd all get pissed, and we'd wait, and we'd be hungry. No yeah. more. We're no. eating at this time. If you choose to come a half hour late, the food will be cold for you, but that's your choice. Yeah, yeah. We'd still love to see you. Right. You're just going to miss some of the meal. <laughs> so it's, it's really taking back your power, taking, controlling what you can. And I think with the, um, you know, the, the 12 step program of that prayer. wisdom. Oh that's, my God. That's it. It yeah. really is. It's such wisdom in the serenity prayer. And I spent so much of my life trying to control what I couldn't. That's how we learn it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> 
So, and I just, I love the questions. I mean, I think they just go deep and really start with your own self. Like, what skills do you already have in terms of being in relationship first with yourself and then with others? Can you regulate your emotions? How do you deal when you have a disappointment or a trigger and all those things that are just such important life skills and very few people learn them? Yeah, so this is, I'm going to promote the hell out of this book. <laughs> I just, I can see how much love and years of, of work went into this and your own experience. And I, I love the stories. I love that you share your own, your own life in there because, you know, when, when you can be humble enough to say, look, I, I went through this and it's, it wasn't easy. You know, I started out talking about, you know, um, talking about Fred and Mary, and I and and I would try to make up a story, and I and then I thought, I, we have had so many struggles in our marriage, and why maybe I'll make Fred and Mary have our story, and then I thought, why are why am I doing that? Why don't I just say this is me? Yeah, and this is how I learned this is. I mean, somebody once said, if you two can work it out, anybody can. This is how I learned it. I have a willing partner. Not always, but I am not always willing either. But <laughs> we did learn a lot of this together um, with a lot of struggle. It didn't, he didn't, you know, we just didn't both just pop up and say, where can we learn the skills? It was really hard and painful at times. And so, I, and I think I just thought, I, I don't want to try to pretend I was born knowing this. I'm not ashamed to my journey. You know, it's. It, it is what it is. And so yeah. I just took out for Fred and Mary and put in Tim and Linda. And my <laughs> husband said, just tell it as long as you don't exaggerate, which I tend to do, um, tell anything you want. That's great. So and he was willing. One on the Enneagram, because I also talk about that in the book. And one's on the Enneagram. I don't know if, if you're into that, but they want to be accurate. But accurate has enough in it that's pretty rich. And, and shocking so I'm <laughs> accurate and he read it all and edited it so it was great you know one of the profound things that you write about is the things that drew you to Tim were the things that were the issues in your marriage so and I see this happens all the time so can you speak to that well yeah I was attracted to him because he was so predictable he did exactly what he was going to say he, what he said he was going to do and he loved me because I was spontaneous. And I remember one day we were driving, we were gonna to go to the um, to Bend, Oregon, which is this place of sun for a weekend and it was raining. And we got to the freeway and I said, let's go to Portland, it's raining. And he said, but we plan to go to Bend. I said, I know, but it's raining. So let's change our mind. He said, but that's the plan. We're all packed, we have an idea. I said, do you have to be so rigid? He said, do you have to be so impulsive? <laughs> so there was the other side of each. I think one of the um, one of the things the chapters of the book I really like is about sex, and that and that chapter was really hard to write because I had read everything I could, every book, every report, and I sat down to try to write how it is, and I was so stuck, and I really really was stuck for a long time on that chapter, and then I had a revelation. None of it makes sense. It, there, it is not how it is. It's the most vulnerable, one of the most crazy, one of the most destructive and magnificent and troubling and tender and confusing parts to us. So the, I, I started the chapter saying that. And when I wrote it, I think I read a couple of pages saying, there are no rules here about how we should be. I mean, I was reading books that said, couples should have sex this many times a week. or yeah. And I, I was trying to be professional. I was trying to be something that was not really very real. So when I gave into it and said, let's start with tenderness and compassion, because that's, that's a place that really does, there's no one size fits all about anything to do with who we are, including sexual. And when I did that, there was this breakthrough moment where I thought, I don't have to know. I can just say, I don't know. Let's welcome. None of us really know. So let's start with that, with that place of compassion. So that was a big moment for me in writing the book that I didn't have to know. I didn't, being an expert 
didn't mean that I had it, anything down. I don't know. Yeah, no, that's the vulnerability piece again, <laughs> that it's not about perfection. It's yeah. not, and I, I totally understand that because as an expert, you feel like all eyes are on you and you have to get it right and you're going to be judged. And what do you mean you're an expert? You're saying things that are wrong here. <laughs> and I don't know. It's right. Old, I don't know. You yeah. Know, try to be kind and, and try it again if it doesn't work, whatever yeah. it is. Yeah. And again, it's, it, all of these things are individual. Like we, there are no hard and fast rules about so many things. It's the principles of compassion, kindness, the values behind it. That to me is the hard and fast place. And when you get that down, then you can make good choices in every other area of your life. And I look like on my Facebook group, your last first date, people are constantly looking for external validation for issues that they, they really know in their heart. I, I have to get out of this relationship or I need, I need to just speak to this person, but I'm, I don't have the courage to do it. And you get all these people giving advice, which is just their point of view. <laughs> That's all it is. And often it's like, you must run this is the way it is. And it's like, no, that's not allowed in my group. I, I don't allow people to have those kinds of, of, you know, black and white thinking and giving people advice. That's just, it's not, that's not necessarily good for you. No, I'm okay. starting a Facebook group for people who are reading my book. I'm doing that too. So that's, that's interesting that you just show how, do you go very often on that page? So I have monitors. I have now I have seven monitors and one who floats when a monitor can't be there. So they, they watch the page for me now because I have about 3,200 women in there. And in the beginning, I ran the whole thing. But what was the most important thing was the guidelines. And the guidelines have to do with kindness, um, compassion, no bullying, no, no bashing, no, you know, no assumptions. Like if people start going into assumptions and, and judgment, we mute them. We, you can yeah. silence somebody. I mean, it's, it's really, to me, they're learning life skills in the group. And, you know, if you want to take your principles and make them part of the guidelines, it's a great idea because people will start to learn just by how they post and how they support. Um, yeah, we also, I can talk to you offline about this, but we also have like, if somebody wants advice, they have to let people know I'm looking for advice or I'm just looking to be witnessed. And yeah. these are how we need to, to communicate in real life. Like, you know, yeah, right. right. So, yeah, so there's a lot of guidance in, in how you, if you want to stay in this group, this is not like every other group where you can just go and just spew and rant. No. That's not happening. It's not going to help anybody. Yeah. That's great. Oh, good. Let's talk offline. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. So Linda, there's so much more we can talk about with the book, but let's talk about what you're creating right now. Is there, is there anything, I mean, the book is huge. I'm sure you're probably going to go on book tour, but tell us what's happening in the present. With the book or with my life? With everything. <laughs> well, I have two things. One is I'm, I am in love with work. I've just come back from New York and California. I work with couples in their hometown. And, that's, and I do deep dives, which are six hours a day. And it's really fantastic. Wow. We, we get so much done. So I've just come back from that last night. So I'm very enthused with the work that I've done. And the other thing I'm doing is I have a nonprofit. And I have it with a very dear friend who's a, um, I, who's a singer, Peter Yarrow. He was Peter, Paul, and Mary. Mm -hmm. And he, I went with him to a concert in Tijuana where he was playing for the migrants. And I, and I just said, we have to do something. He said, okay, if you create concerts, I'll sing, but don't make me go to board meetings. <laughs> so we're, that's called Just One at a Time. And that's got my heart when I was talking to my girlfriend about that Saturday, she said, it's like you ha are in love. I'm in love with, I'm in love with the work. I mean, I, the, the issue, I don't try to figure out what we should do about immigration. That's not my thing, but I work in Mexico at Rancho La Puerta. I'm there 10 weeks a year. So I'm there a lot. I, and I just know that it's a humanitarian crisis. So feel, and my husband's wonderful at helping me. 
Um, it's something we do not together, but he supports me in it. And I think that that has been a great thing for us too. So I'm doing that. I'm, uh, I'm starting an online course, which is a whole learning, because I've been teaching 25 years. And so this is a gr big learning for me. And I want to say it's all wonderful, but it's not. <laughs> I don't have the chip. <laughs> You know, if you give me a poem, I can figure it out. Or give me a couple in great distress and I can sit with them. But ask me to figure out technological things. I have no, I can't, I can't rely on intuition because it's not there. So that's a big stretch, but I really believe in it. I love the cl that class we've done and we're, um, we're figure, I have great helpers. So that's one of the things I'm doing. Um, I'm an inner fitness coach in Mexico at Rancho, at the wonderful Rancho La Puerta. You'd be a great speaker there. I would love to go there. It's so great. And I have, a, a, so I love being there. Um, what am I doing? We have a puppy who's a year. And as I just posted on my Instagram page, having a joint love object is so wonderful for our relationship. And our puppy is, loves television. And watches TV. And the other night I went to sleep. My husband was watching Netflix and I woke up and Jackson was sitting on the pillow with his head resting on Tim's shoulder and they were watching something together. I mean, it was That's so cute. But it's also so, it's such a great thing between us. It's sort of embarrassing. Like nobody hears us, but the way we go on about him, you know, it's sort of embarrassing. <laughs> but I think we need a mission that's bigger than us in our relationships, whatever that is. And that is an, 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 a mission, maybe a family, it may be saving turtles, it may be just supporting each other in your work, but something bigger than the two of you that brings you out of yourselves, I think is another secret to wholehearted love. I so agree with you. And I, I love the term wholehearted love. Wholehearted love. I, I have a client who works with immigrants and I'll have to let her know about your mission. Um, Thank you. Yeah. But she, she works with food and she takes the immigrants who come to the United States and she lives in Texas and she has them create meals based on their traditions. And she loves helping immigrants. And so she had met a guy who also had a mission and he was traveling and turned out he was a jerk. Um, but, but we realized through that, that situation that, that having a mission is such an important part to her, her life, like her life goals in terms of relationship that she doesn't want to, she doesn't want to give that up in the future. And uh, yeah, I, I so agree. I remember being a single mother and I remember a client came in to me one day and she had, she had five kids like I did and she had just gotten out of a mental institution this was like one of the hardest times of my life and she said it was wonderful she spent a month in there they gave her food I said what happened to your kids she said oh I, they went to foster care and I remember coming home thinking maybe I just won't get up tomorrow morning and I'll go somewhere my kids they'll take someone will take care of them I'll get fed oatmeal I can't do it and I, the next morning I mean I had that thought and the next morning I woke up and I'm making lunches, getting kids to brush their teeth. And then I thought, I thought I wasn't going to get up this morning, but I did because there was something beyond what I felt that the feeling of feeling so paralyzed in my life at that time, it was just impossible, but I did it because I had to get kids off to school. And I learned something from that, that having a mission, I wasn't capable of just saying, I'm not going to get up. I mean, she had other things going on, but it was attractive. I'll tell you at that moment. <laughs> And I, and I realized that having something that gets you out of bed or gets you out of the fight, you know, that old story, you're having a fight with your partner, the neighbor rings the bell and says, can I borrow sugar? And you smile at them. You've just wanted to kill each other, but you go into that, <laughs> that there is something that calls us into our better self. And we need that, whether it's a dog or migrants or, you know, or cleaning out the neighbor's you know, an, an old neighbor's property, something beyond the two of us. And I think couples need that. Yeah. Not at first, because at first it's just about each other. But as you go through cycles, something that calls you to your better self again and again and helps That's you totally. grow up differently. I think singles need it. I think, you know, to get out of feeling sorry for yourself. You, we all you, need it. Right? Yes. Right? We, we all need, need it. it. And one of the reasons I went into coaching after my divorce was because I had done art my whole life. I had helped my husband who was a comedian. I wrote, wrote for him and I directed and, 
-huh. And it, it just felt like it wasn't enough. Like I wanted to do something bigger with my life yes. and, you know, creating beautiful art was something, but it was very insular and I wanted to make a bigger impact. And this we just spoke to me. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, so are you ready for the lightning round? I'm going to ask you a bunch of quick questions and then we'll wrap. All right. So fill in the blank. I used to think I wasn't blank enough. I used to think that I wasn't worthy enough. What was the number one thing holding you back from being a woman of value? Not understanding that I could have boundaries. Okay. Having violated very young in many ways, multiple ways, not just personally, but culturally. And when I realized I could say no, I learned how to say yes too understanding what boundaries really were hmm. from the inside out. Boundaries are everything. <laughs> I love boundaries. I teach boundaries. I have a whole course on boundaries with a co-leader and knowing our yeses and nos is just, oh my God, you got to know both. Um, what's a mistake you made that taught you an important life lesson? An important life lesson. Um, a, a mistake I made that I talked about, this was a mistake in the book is, um, <laughs> is I, when, when t my husband's from New Zealand and in the days when he lived there, we made each other very steamy tapes. And I made him a tape at three in the morning, so steamy, I didn't send it and I threw it in a box and threw it out. And a couple of weeks later, I had a client who wanted some information about meditation. So I had a reel to reel. Do you remember those days? Yep. <laughs> and I found a blank tape and I made, I copied a tape I had and gave it to her. And she came back a couple days later and handed it to me and said, I don't think you wanted me to have this. <laughs> Somehow, it was the tape to my then <laughs> lover that was so embarrassing, I didn't send it to him. And I saw that tape and I thought, I cannot live with this. Oh my God. <laughs> my life is over. I'm, we're moving. I had to tell my kids we're moving and I have to get a new career. And it was a moment where I, I froze in horror. And... The, and I called a girlfriend and I said, I can't believe this. And she said, go out and touch the tree in the backyard. I said, that's crazy. I can't do that. I've got to start packing. <laughs> Just go touch the tree. And I walked out to touch the tree. And I remember there was a heron that was circling the pond. And I looked up at the heron. I started shouting at it. And I saw, followed the heron that went away. And then I noticed the fish. Suddenly I was breathing again. Mm. And I had paused. And I didn't know then, I know now how to do it for myself. I had paused and the pause brought me back to myself. And after that happened, I figured out I didn't have to move. I had to clean up this mess and it was a mess, um, but I, it, it taught me something really, really important. Wow. Take, take a breath, step back. Breath. So I'm curious, this isn't part of the lightning round, but <laughs> if this happened today, how would you have handled it? I would go into the same mortification. I would feel like I, I would have all those thoughts. It's over. I can't practice. I'm so embarrassed. But it would be a, it would be a nanosecond. They would come. And I would say, I would hold my, I would just put my hands here. I'd say, Linda, you can do all those things. You can move tomorrow. But right now, just go out and see the tree and back off and take a breath. And then it moves you into something else. So it wouldn't have taken, I wouldn't have had to call my friend. I would have had that set. You know, I still get into power struggles with my husband. We still get into it, but we back off. We know how to regulate. Don't, you don't have to keep it going. So I know how to do it. I'm quicker on the, quicker to do it. Yeah. And you don't have to phone a friend. <laughs> um, that's great. This is a great story. What is the best advice that you can give to a woman who wants to become more empowered? I thought about that. That's a great question. And you know what, I, my first thought was be there for yourself, but that's not the answer. If you want to be more empowered, I think you need to find support because we think the same way. We think on a wheel over and over the same thoughts. Finding, a, finding girlfriends that are on a different path, joining a group, finding a coach, finding a therapist, listening to podcasts. I always listen to Pima Chodra and that's my secret, my secret that I pull out when I'm really needing some, some reminders. I love Pima. 
finding something that takes you out of your circular way of thinking. If you want to be more empowered, hang out with more empowered people and, and who can help you make those changes. Mm, that's really good advice. Yes, people like, go out and change yourself, <laughs> you know, and it's, it's getting the right support is so important. I, I phoned a friend today because I needed support. And I said, can you come up and have lunch with me? Because I'm having a hard day. And she's like, all right. She drove an hour to meet me. We had lunch and she left. And I'm like in a great mood now. Back to uh, yourself, right? Yes. Ex yeah. And I knew I, need, I needed to take a break. I was just, I, I was too immersed in what was going on for me. And she's one of those friends that can lift me up. Not every friend can do that. And finally, Linda... How would you like to be remembered? I'd like to be remembered as somebody that um, helped people normalize their imperfections, that made them laugh, and that um, and gave them the belief in themselves to figure out what they're here to do. Mm, that's so beautiful. Well, I so appreciate that you're showing up like this in the world already. And I know that you are changing so many lives. And I just love this conversation. Always love talking to you. So and thank again, you. talking to you. Thank you so much. If you would like to step more fully into your value, grab a free copy of The Ultimate Guide to Becoming a Woman of Value on my website, thewomanofvalue.com. Just click the link at the top of the homepage. And if you haven't already done so, be sure to click the subscribe button in your listening app. And if there's something in this episode that inspired you, please share it with others. Because the more we share these inspirational stories, the more women of value we will have in this world. I'll see you next time.